Okay, everybody, please welcome with me Tiago Carvalho, who is a founder and CEO of uh, Garimpo. We would love to know what does that mean or if it has a story. <laughs> Garimpo is a startup, a software company in uh, Brazil. Uh, previously, Tiago was a director of engineering at Tulane. He led uh, European merchandising engineering at Wayfair building op uh, operational tools used to manage millions of projects. Tiago also led the checkout and payment team at West Wing and held software engineering positions at various media and advertisement companies. Tiago is a self-taught software engineer and believes that engineering teams thrive when there's trust, autonomy, mastery, and a shared purpose. Dear Tiago, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, so welcome everyone. This is the first of these remote things I'm doing in this format. So let's see how it goes. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about management challenges, uh, specifically technical quality timelines and decisions. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to just interrupt me and ask. I'll try to make a few pauses also. I don't have the chat visible, so I'm not reading what you're saying there, but if someone chimes in with audio, I can uh, happily answer the questions. So we, we will inform you if someone is uh, using the chat function. So I think it is very valuable for people to, to those threshold uh, suggest something. So please people use the chat and we will moderate uh, what you are uh, writing. Yeah, I'm, I'm pro chat. I'm just not managing everything <laughs> in the screen. Cool. So just a little bit about the target audience for this, uh, for this talk, it's humans leading technical teams. And I use leading in the most charitable, open, uh, broad uh, meaning possible. So if you're doing anything beyond just getting a bunch of tickets and getting them done, you do some sort of leadership. So hopefully you'll find something useful here. Just a little bit about me again, uh, stuff to the, the, the intro, but just so you know, uh, social director of uh, engineering at Wayfair. So I work with a pretty large team, 50 engineers there. We had uh, a significant catalog of products with a bunch of users. So just to give like a, a, an idea of the scale of kind of the kind of decisions that we had to make there and uh, the levels of interaction in those decisions. And more recently, before coming to Brazil and starting my own thing, uh, I was at Tour Lane as director of engineering. Um, the team had just grown from five to 30 people. So it was in an interesting stage and we had to organize a lot of things. Uh, and I ran software engineering, data engineering, IT, and support the product team. We are talking a lot about uh, data science here. Uh, I don't have experience with data science uh, and I also don't have experience with data engineering. But I remember when I, when I took over this team, I told them, Okay, my job is not to be a better data engineer than you are. My job is to help you be uh, the best data engineer that you can be. So I believe that a lot of these principles of, of management, they translate well, no matter the area and especially around tech. Okay, so that's a little bit about me. Another thing to keep in mind, um, as any good manager or any decent manager, Whenever you ask them a question, the only honest answer they can give you is it depends because there are so many variables, right? Um, so just keep this in mind. I'm talking a little bit from my experience and when we get to questions, uh, we can get to something that's more um, specific to your, to your needs, but just keep this in mind. Like it really depends on the context. Okay, so in reverse order of our title, we're gonna talk about decisions, timelines and technical quality decisions. Um, three things, uh, here are three things that have helped me in decision making over the years. So remembering the end goal, not by chatting, and moving fast on two-way door decisions. And we'll just drill down into all this. Okay, to remember the end goal, uh, and I know it's getting confusing because there are a lot of questions, but we're going to expand on this a little bit. There are four questions that I think are very important. What is our goal? What is like the, the big thing that we want to accomplish? What specific problem are we solving right now? How does solve this problem help us achieve our goal? And should we solve this problem now? So 
nothing really complex, right? But let's just go through an example here. So imagine that we, we have this big problem that we want to solve and you can think of something in your field, something you're working on right now. What is, you know, kind of the vision, the, the big uh, headline, the, the big hairy problem that you want to solve. Uh, okay, this is defined, but this problem is usually very big and it's hard to solve uh, a big problem like this. So we naturally split it into smaller chunks. And that defines the second question, which what problem are we solving right now? Uh, and let's say for, for this example, we are focusing on the first, this first chunk here. So instead of having the context of the entire problem in our minds, we just slice it into smaller problems and now we're super focused on problem one, which is great. We do a lot of progress. So we got a lot of things done and our project is moving along. But one side effect of having focus on this one uh, piece of the project is that we can lose sight of the rest of the project. So quite often it will happen, uh, we'll get to a point like this, where we start developing or coloring a little bit outside the line. So imagine that I'm building um, some sort of, um, a system that needs some sort of export functionality. So the specification or the need really of our customer, of our team, is to support this to CSV. And so it's a huge project, but right now I'm focused on the export functionality. If I'm focused here, I can start building the CSV export and suddenly think like, oh, like I could also export, export to PDF. I could do like a fancy Excel. There's this other format that would be really cool. And then I start bleeding into this red area that is really outside of the scope of the, the project. And by doing that, I'm not doing other things that are within the scope and still need to be done. Um, so really using this question, how does solving this problem help us uh, achieve our goal, helps us come back to like, oh, like why do I need to do an export to PDF? Oh, actually I don't, let me focus on something else. And the other question is, should we solve this problem now, which is also a very common problem Similar thing, we zoom in into this idea of exporting and suddenly you can find yourself in a way like, oh, like what if we need to export at a super massive scale, the code that we have doesn't really work. We need something much fancier, much more complicated. And you're, you're developing in this corner here, the, the green dotted line outside of the, the little amoeba, um, which is a problem that you probably will have two years from now or a year from now and you're, you're investing in that, but there's no guarantee that your project is actually gonna live two years. So even though it, it feels when you're zoomed in, in into this item that this makes sense and you're kind of future-proofing, you could be wasting your effort because you haven't guaranteed, you know, we still have two, three, four, and five of those other chunks to develop. So our efforts would be better used there. Um, so this is the, the little framework around decision-making um don't bike shed so this is pretty well known in the development community this is this idea that there is if there is uh, a group of people you know a bunch of leaders and managers approving the the plan for a nuclear power plant they will generally approve that plan relatively fast because you know you get like this block of 500 pages of technical specification uh, you don't really, if you're, if you're not from the area, you don't really understand the details, the nuance. You just assume that people did their due diligence and you're, yeah, sure. Like this, this makes sense. But on that same meeting that the, you know, the 500 page document was approved in an instant, there's this discussion to build a little bike shed for the employees to park their bicycles. Uh, and in the story, uh, they spent a ton of time deciding what color they should paint the bike shed. And the idea is, is this idea that the smaller the topic, the longer the debate. So I don't really feel qualified or I don't want to put the mental effort to really give a smart opinion or to contribute to the nuclear power plant project. So it's easier for me to say like, oh, I have an opinion about the color of the bike shed and that can become like a massive uh, discussion. So just keeping that in mind, like if, if you're in a meeting, if you're discussing something with your team, is this, is this, are we talking about the power plant or the bike shed? So let's, let's talk about the power plant. 
and moving fast on two-way door decisions. This is something from Jeff Bezos, if I'm not mistaken. And he talks about one-way door decisions and two-way door decisions. You can kind of picture the, the, the difference. So one-way door, once you're on the other side, it's very hard, very expensive, or impossible to come back. And on two-way door decisions, you can go and come back, and it's cheap, it's effortless. You can revert this decision easily. And the example that comes to mind for me is we will often have in teams um, heated discussions about what time the daily stand-up should be. And let's say it's at nine, and the team can the team will spend half a day discussing what time the stand-up should be. And often, as a leader, one thing that that you can do, and that I do quite often in these cases, seeing that those are two-way door decisions, like, hey, let's test this for a week. We move it to ten. We move it to nine thirty. We test it for a week, then we come back to it and decide uh, if this change sticks or it doesn't. Um, yeah, so these are the three things around decision making that I find interesting. So keep in mind the end goal, uh, make sure you're working on the right scope, don't bike shed, and move fast on two way door decisions. Do we have any questions on this so far? And I have the chat. I, I, I do have a question. So um, I, I really found this intriguing, the shorter, the smaller the problem, the longer the uh, discussions. But I, I feel that sometimes this just drifts out of control. You know, as you are, um, you're trying to moderate a discussion. Um, and I feel that there is a reason Maybe sometimes there's a reason that uh, uh, this, the small things create the largest discussions in the people actually be because they may be the, uh, the people mostly affected. So there's like a hierarchy of problems and also a hierarchy of uh, uh, people that are affected by smaller things versus larger things. So uh, how, like, how do you take into account the different perspectives of the people and not make make sure that you're not kind of uh, uh, down voting their uh, their opinion on such things? Uh, yeah. Um, so the you generally want to to move the decision closer to the the people that are impacted by that. So, you know, if, if, you're, if you're managing a team and there is a topic that you're, you're really far away from that, um, just go to the person that is most effective and get their opinion. So in this case, I would, I would tend to move the, this two-way door decision to that person and then as a leader support them to get that through the group. Because if, if you have a group of 10 people and there are two people that are really affected by that problem, why would you discuss as 10 people about that, right? Uh, so either get those two people and say like, hey, like by, the, by tomorrow, can you two meet and make a decision about this? Or as a leader, you kind of just um, elevate their voice by getting their opinion first, maybe something on the agenda that you know that they care about. Um, so I think there's a little bit of, of managing the, the dynamic of the room because you usually have someone who is very talkative who will speak all the time and will want to move the, the meeting all the time in their, the direction that they prefer. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think in this line of just kind of raising the voice of, of the people that need to be heard about that topic. Uh, that's a very good uh, answer. Thank you so much. Welcome. Any, any other questions? I have uh, another question about uh, chopping up the problem. You mentioned that the Problem is usually that you start a certain part of fixing the problem and then starting to actually color outside the lines. But I honestly think it's already very hard to have a very big problem and to make a strategy to chop it up in several pieces. Uh, any comments on that? Uh, yes, it is hard. <laughs> um, the, um, okay. So I think you that's a very good question um it, it depends a little bit because for some things in a project you really know what to do right you know what what's going on you know how to slice that um i would say 
it is hard at the beginning of the project to slice everything correctly. So probably you will slice uh, this project the best you can with information that you have, but some of those chunks, they will be, they will have some amount of uncertainty and investigation baked into them where, you know, like, oh, this slice of the pie is actually figuring out what this slice of the pie is. Um, so you can do a little bit, and we'll, we'll mention this later, that you can do a little bit of planning with the um, intention of learning, right? So just being honest about, oh, these are the things that I know and, you know, fairly confident we can slice this in a certain way. And here's this block of unknowns and I'm going to slice it uh, in a way that moves me closer to knowing what to do. So you don't have to, to plan from the beginning, uh, assuming that you have total control or total knowledge of what needs to be done. Did I actually answer your question? I hope so. I mean, more or less in the sense that uh, getting a grasp on the problem and knowing what you need to do is, of course, a prerequisite in order to slice a problem. Uh, but I think in project management, uh, just not knowing exactly what you need to do is one of the biggest challenges that I uh, face in, in you know, decision making because how can you make a, an informed decision if you are not absolutely sure what is the part of the project you want to do and how you want to move on with the project because you don't want to, you cannot uh, address the big, big problem all at once and you don't know how to slice it. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I would understand you don't have, um, you know, uh, one size fit it all answer to this type of uh, I, really, I really don't. And, and I think it is the challenge of the, of the job, right? This is why we make money because this thing is hard. Um, this reminds me of, uh, I'm not sure if, you, if you're familiar with the work of Carol Dweck uh, and she talks about the growth mindset. Um, so I, I think it's sometimes when we talk about project management, we come from um, what she calls like this fixed mindset where the kind of intelligence is static and knowledge is static and something that you either know or you don't know. And if you don't know, you cannot start. Uh, and around the fixed mindset is this idea that you can always grow and can always learn. I'm, I may be misrepresenting her work, but I'll just keep going. Um, and so it's, I think it's kind of accepting that there are unknowns and you need to figure them out as you go. Uh, but yeah, it is hard. I absolutely agree. Um, okay. So Welcome. As soon as I can get my mouse to work, we'll continue. And now the chat is in front of my slide. Bear with me. Man, this is a nightmare. Okay, we'll make two. Uh, so timelines. I'm not going to talk a lot about timelines, uh, but happy to answer questions. Um, okay, I actually cannot really see my stuff, so shouldn't have opened the. Well, I said everything is okay. okay. I had to escape. No, my the so the 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 comments were like in front of my slide. I couldn't see anything, but now I'm good. Uh, timelines. Uh, so a little bit kind of tying to what we were just talking, um, estimate in order to learn, don't manufacture certainty. Uh, if you don't know something, you don't know something. And you can give up on your project. Uh, you can stop working or you can figure out a way of, okay, like what don't I know? What is the next thing that I need to know? And then you can estimate that work, right? Um, if Estimation is it's a complicated thing because it is both. Uh, so we live in the real world, there are constraints, your project has a certain budget, it needs to be done in a certain timeline, but it necessarily there are many unknowns in your project. If there weren't, someone else would have done this already, right? We're working on interesting things that are complicated or complex uh, and we need to learn a ton as we're building those. So I, I find that this mindset, so like, hey, like, the, the goal of my estimation is not to, with 100% of accuracy, predict the future. My goal is to learn 
in a way that doesn't destroy my project. It's kind of bounded in a way that the project can move forward. Uh, something really uh, uh, obvious, let's say, uh, smaller units of work are easier to estimate. So don't you know, look at the whole project and say like, oh, this is going to take this much time. Try to slice it a little bit and then you're going to have a better idea like, okay, like this half of the project or this of, of this 20 things that need to be done, 10, I know, understand them really well. I think I can estimate them with uh, a, a higher degree of certainty and the rest, you know that there's more uncertainty. Uh, and just one question that I, I, find it really I find really interesting is how much time should a team of four estimate a one hour task, right? Uh, what is the, and this is kind of random, but what is the return on investment in estimating every single task to a certain level of detail? Would it be faster to just, you know, do it, the four of you, uh, instead of just discussing how long it will take and what tasks are worth estimating what, which ones aren't. So, as I said, I, I'm not going to go like, too much into estimation, but if that's a, a hot topic, I'm happy to, to discuss more on the questions. Really recommend this video uh, from Woody Zuel. Uh, the name is No Estimates, which is very um, um, kind of clickbaity. The, the discussion is more nuanced than just uh, don't estimate at all, but it's a really interesting, interesting video. So estimate in order to learn. If you don't know something, you don't know it. Stop fooling yourself and estimate smaller chunks of work. Any questions on timelines? Okay, we move on. And technical quality, um, always a fun one. So the things that I found useful in the topic of technical quality are the concept of speed to value, uh, there are the four key metrics from this book called Accelerate that I'm going to talk a little bit about. And there's this nice quote from uh, Martin Fowler that I want to share with you, talking about Kruk being part of the process. So building things that are subpar, that just aren't great, is part of the, the, this process. Okay, speed to value. So the idea of speed to value is the fast delivery of incremental value. Right? So you want to move fast and you want to deliver value incrementally. You don't want to have, you generally don't want to have a big bang release where you, you go into a cave, you work on a project for a year, then you come back and you release that. You want to add value incrementally uh, as much as you can. Uh, and to give, uh, I have two examples that we can discuss a little bit. So imagine that, so I'm, I'm in the context of like a lead phase uh, business. So imagine you have a hypothesis to increase your conversion rate, uh, but you have no data to back it up. So you could spend three weeks working on the perfect solution, launch and measure, and then you decide if that project lives on or dies. Or you could spend something like four days building a very small version. You launch, you measure. If it really brings the value that you anticipated, then you can spend four weeks building the next iteration. The the option B takes um, four weeks and four days. Option A takes three weeks. But the, the benefit of, of option B is that if after four days, and maybe uh, why, so I, I didn't really account for the time um, measuring. Um, after four days and whatever time you need to measure the results, you already know if you can abandon that project. So you, you create a value, even if, if that project fails, you added value to the overall um, organization because now you have more knowledge. You know that this approach doesn't work. So we just save something like three weeks. Um, and another example would be uh, something like we have a proven hypothesis. We could spend three weeks delivering 100% of value. So this is you go into your cave and you build that and then you release into the world. Or if you have something that can really be split into, into multiple parts, you could spend, uh, you could do one week iterations that deliver 25% of the value. And it would take longer, it would take you four weeks to get the full value, 
but you're already profiting from that from the end of week one. Uh, so move the learning to look closer to the, to the beginning of the project. The sooner you can learn, the sooner you can adapt because we're not manufacturing certainty here. We're, we're doing everything uh, with the purpose of learning. Um, so this is speed development. The other thing that uh, I find very useful in technical quality are the four key metrics. There's a lot of discussion on, on how to ensure quality, should you count lines of code, how do you measure performance of people, how do you know that your code is good. Um, there's this book called Accelerate. It's really, really good. If you need to you know, get deeper into technical quality, I really recommend that you read that. And the too long didn't read of this book is called the four key metrics, which are lead time, so this is the time it takes from when a feature is requested until it's available to a customer. Uh, and you can measure that in many different ways. Deployment frequency, so how often do changes to your project go to production? Again, the idea that um, having more deploys means smaller releases um, and you're releasing often so you can learn faster and you're releasing smaller to reduce risk. Mean time to restore. So when something breaks and something will break, how long does it take for your team to fix that? And finally, the change fail percentage. So for each new release that we make, um, how many of those results in some sort of failure? And based on their research, it's like really comprehensive. These four things will give you like a really nice picture of technical quality within your team. And finally here, uh, I'm committing two sins of the um, presentations. One is a slide uh, full of text, and two is I'm gonna actually read this for you because I think, um, oh man, and now I have my screen problem again. Um, so I'm gonna change my plan. I'm gonna give you a minute to read this because I think Martin Fowler really explains this much better than I could. So I'll give you a minute. Okay. Can you explain what the craft is? Or did I miss that? Uh, oh yeah, uh, it, it's um, um, low quality uh, kind of garbage. It's just like low quality work. So teams okay. will, even the best teams, so from, from his experience, people uh, really understand what the architecture of that software should be more or less a year after they've been working with it because of the amount of unknowns and you're kind of tying things together. And during this process, you're creating a lot of things that are just, they're just not good. And the reason why you build these, you know, questionable classes and questionable uh, modules is that you don't really have the confidence to invest the amount of time that that would need to be done correctly because you, you don't really know how that will tie to the rest of the project. So going back to the speed to value idea it is better for you to build something that's kind of like eh, uh, and learn fast and then you can come back and and kind of clean that up and that's what he talks about at the end uh, when he's talking about the the best teams where not only they create less of this craft so even when they're moving fast when they're building things in a smart way they are generally doing a good job but also the 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 craft that they create they're much better at removing that once the certainty is in place, once you really know like, oh yeah, now I understand this module and I can really um, work on it. Um, so um, so you, I, I would say just go agile about the previous yes. slide. Do, yeah. do, we have a, do we have a slide about agile? Uh, Not really, oh man, I didn't can talk you, about agile. Um, Can you just please, because I think that's really a very uh, 
like um, kind of not famous uh, 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 um, uh, like uh, a way to think in in research. Please, if you could like yeah. say a couple of words about it. Cool. Thank you. Man, how did I miss that? Okay, so um, the classic software development model uh, is called waterfall. And you can just imagine kind of a, a waterfall fall where you have, so you have the design of the project, then it falls into development, then testing, then release, right? So you have these very distinct uh, pieces, different people work on those. And generally in this model, you have this massive documentation uh, that you build in this first phase and it's usually signed, right? In, in big companies, you would actually need, you know, like a, a VP to sign that thing. If there are changes in the future, you also need to sign that. So you have this massive um, um, specification and then everything follows that specification. That has a few problems. So it, it gives us this uh, illusion of, of certainty. You know, I know what I'm building. I have this extensive documentation but you lose flexibility. So if someone made a mistake in the beginning, or if, if we didn't know something about the market or if the market changed, there's, it's very hard to adapt. And so the incentive is not to adapt. The incentive is to carry on with your plan and just execute that. Um, more recently, I am bad with dates, maybe the 2000s. Uh, there's a movement called the, the um, uh, Agile movement. And the, the whole idea is that it, it really is around this idea of experimentation. So instead of having a six month cycle to release something, you move to cycles that are much shorter. You have a cycle of two weeks uh, generally. Uh, and you really plan, that gives you the flexibility to plan uh, and to adapt to changes. Um, the, I think fundamentally that's the, the main difference between waterfall and agile. Agile has a lot of problems also, or uh, it kind of became something of a religion where there's, you know, the true way of doing Agile, uh, which defeats some of its purpose, but conceptually, you know, oh, there's certainty, we plan things, and then, oh, there isn't really certainty, we need to do smaller iterations so we can adapt and just move faster and deliver things faster. Um, one example from the waterfall world is the um, Clippy. I'm not sure if you remember on Windows, you know, I see you're typing a letter. Do you want to <laughs> do whatever? And this is something it. that the team, <laughs> the team at Microsoft <laughs> thought people would love and months of work, months of planning. And that's something if they had put that in front of 10 people, that are not their mothers or uh, people on the team, they would know they're like, oh my God, we hate this. Um, so yeah, just as, as an example. Okay, any any questions on Agile or some of the stuff that, that I've talked so far? Or any questions whatsoever? Okay, that sounds like a no. Um, cool. So just big recap. Um, oh, hang on. There's a text yeah. thing here. What about test driven development? Amazing. Love it. Um, so I think test driven development is one of those things, personal opinion, I guess, as everything I just said so far, um, test driven development is something that, that has become a little bit of a, you know, like a cult, like a, a religion within uh, software development, because you, you have people that will say like, oh, you cannot write a line of code before you write a unit test. And maybe that works for them. Uh, and there are people that because of all of that, they just don't really care. The, what I would say is it depends. Uh, if you work, in if you're building something that has a lot of pure functions, right? So you don't have a lot of things with side effects. It's going to be very easy to, to test, but also what is the, um, the level of how fault tolerant is your product is the thing that you're building. So I would say test driven development can be a really powerful tool, but it really depends on your context. Um, 
if you're working with a team of very senior people that have experience uh, doing test-driven development, if you um, have a problem that really is, is conducive to that, I think go and use it. But I, I wouldn't really advertise that as like a, everyone should be doing test-driven development or something of that sort. Very long answer, sorry. Did you, Sebastian, did you have like anything more specific about uh, test driven development or this rent was enough? Was enough, apparently. Yeah, thank <laughs> okay. you so much. Uh, we, have, we have a dedicated uh, talk uh, tomorrow about uh, best test practices. So, Sebastian, if you stick with us tomorrow at 12 with Shams. Thank you, Thiago. Yeah, let's move on. Yeah. And, and, and Shams can correct me. Ah, oh, Shams. Of course, you know. <laughs> okay. Okay, friends. Um, any other questions? Anything, maybe something specific about a project you're working on or a specific problem you have? I think we still have like seven minutes. So I think for us, this is really interesting because it's a change of perspective. We're in academia, right? So um, we, the way we are, organizing research is uh, not exactly or one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, comparable, but I think we can still learn a lot from uh, these things. And also what is becoming clear is that more and more research leaders will also become software developers in a way, you know, because we, will, we are very dependent on uh, new technology and um, there's almost no successful uh, research laboratory anymore without software developers. And we researchers come from a different background and also have different interests, I would say, but we still have to uh, manage these developers and have to make sure, uh, basically learning by doing, uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, find a balance between you know, intellectual or uh, uh, content related discussions, but also uh, creating a manageable uh, software development plan. For example, uh, Andreas Swan, we had some talks yesterday showing uh, uh, an open source toolbox. And he, he is a medical doctor. He's like, doing the majority of the development uh, himself. He has onboarded uh, international open source contributors and contributors, but ultimately we will rely on, uh, on people who have experience and uh, learn from people like you have who have experience in uh, managing uh, such uh, projects. And uh, we will probably have to step up our game in the future to uh, really make the most of the time that we are spending in our projects. So I think it's uh, really great to see um, like how you are doing it and what you find important. I think one, one uh, perspective I, that I already noticed, um, for example, from working with Safa, is that in research, we have a, a multitude of, of, of different um, uh, problems that we have to deal with every day. And m most of them do not relate to software development. So creating, I, I think what is still needed and not out there, at least as far as I know, is someone who, consult, who consults researchers in how to integrate um, certain aspects of software development into the entire research environment, right? So for example, uh, you are saying, um, in the beginning you were saying uh, uh, managing a project is more than just creating tickets and working them off. Actually, this ticket system doesn't work in research really because we, are, uh, we have too many facets and too many things with every step you need to discuss it's not like you can simply do like a small task and get this done. Most of the tasks that need to be done require a lot of discussion and interaction. 
And I think that is uh, uh, something where there's a huge opportunity, I guess, for also people like you, software development and, in, and experts in management in trying to improve the way uh, researchers uh, can manage their projects. I, I, I just yep. want to uh, follow up with Julian and then Tiago, uh, please uh, wrap uh, even uh, my comment over. I think uh, regarding the last point, uh, uh, Julia, thinking that uh, research is different. I think uh, working in, in this uh, RT uh, big project is more complicated in management and communication wise than in research, I promise you. And um, I think, yes, uh, research and uh, RT is not like the same uh, thing, but um, if research is more open, I think it's IT and software industry, the, there's a lot of very successful uh, 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 stories there. And if IT and research, if research, research has been uh, started to open more, uh, exactly about uh, best management uh, or better management approaches, the pace will be uh, accelerated. And uh, um, Think will be a uh, better quality. We will get better quality and and uh, what yeah. we have. I completely yeah. agree. I think was something that we um, uh, missed. Both both missed is that uh, we in research we have limited resources, right? So um, usually one person is doing one project. We don't have like uh, a team of 10 people working on the same problem. We usually have one person working on one problem. I think that that is uh, making, that's what I said when uh, 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 the interactions are more difficult. It's not because it's more difficult uh, in terms of uh, the discussions or content, but it's more difficult because you have one person for one problem and you have another person for another problem, you have a third person for a third problem and you kind of manage your team uh, from the start, like even the smallest uh, part of your, uh, of your lab or is very valuable. And for me, every lab person who does a lab rotation is, uh, who is a student and would like to work for a few months does a very independent own project and does not have like a ton of people supporting him. So I think, uh, how, yeah, how does that work different. for you? Yeah. So what are the smallest yeah. team sizes that you would manage? Um, so the, we, I'm not sure how we are time-wise though, um, but I, I wouldn't really call it a team if I don't have at least three people working constantly together. Uh, it would be a group of people, you know, if I have two people only, or if I have just one person working together, it would be very concerned yeah. uh, because you don't have this exchange. It's, it's really, really complicated. Um, so I, I don't, I think my solution would be to, even if I had, I actually have done this in the past, like I had people working on some, on things that were kind of different and they sort of forced that to become a team just so, you know, they would sit together and go to lunch and have at least the social aspect of working together. Yeah. Uh, but that, that's a tough, a tough problem. Um, so no, I mean, yeah, I, I think um, we have teams, but um, they are not working on the exactly the same problem. That's that's yeah. the issue. So we're going to lunch together, of course, and we're discussing our progress. But uh, it's mainly the progress of the individual rather than the team. Yeah, and I think in some ways that these skills of, of coding and programming and whatnot, I think it's more around. Uh, if, if we need to end, just let me know. Uh, I think it's more around um, the product management aspect than the engineering proper, because if you're if you're deploying, you know, your time incorrectly, you can be a genius, but you're going to build the wrong thing. Um, so you know, I, I think sort of like how we had people that like typists in the past. This is sort of going to be product management in a way. Please, product managers. Forgive me. Uh, where everyone will need to have that skill, it's something that's going to be very common. Uh, so I, I think the key is more around the, the management of time than the technical skill itself. And this field is very new, right? And maybe this is a little bit of the, the difference. So I, I don't really know academia. I finished high school, right? That's the, the <laughs> most I studied. Um, but. <laughs> I think there is, because of our ignorance as, you know, a new field, we don't know what's going on. We're just figuring out as it goes. It, it gets 
paradoxically into a more kind of, uh, you know, scientific method kind of thing. We're like, hey, like, we don't know this. We need to figure it out. What can we try? Let's do it. Where I feel like from academia, you have, you're really standing to the shoulder of giants and you have these precedents and you're kind of honoring that and also innovating. I think it's, it's a, a much more complicated challenge. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. I think we're uh, perfectly in time now to wrap up. Does anyone else have a comment or question or a, a discussion point regarding the interface of um, industry development and management and academia? I think it's a really relevant topic also because uh, academic jobs are so sparse. So people who are uh, a lot of people move out from academia into industry and I think there's also like a, a cultural shock in between these yeah. fields. I can imagine. So uh, Jonathan is uh, uh, saying that he thinks that uh, ac academia should learn much more from the industry management, business management and he thanks you very much for your talk. So I think that's a great <laughs> last comment. And uh, it's really nice, been really nice to have you. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you so much here. for the invite. All right. Um, okay.